It sounds silly. You want to get better at doing longer fasts. So the layperson would tell you, uh, just don't eat for longer periods of time. But it's not that easy, right? You've been there before. You feel really good and then all of a sudden you hit that point where like, okay, I'm done. Like I need to eat. There's a period of time when you're fasting where you feel like you could go forever, but then you reach that wall. And if you want to get better at doing longer fasts, you have to practice. But there are some ways that you can expedite that process and improve how quickly you can get to the ability to do a longer fast. Let's break it down. After this video, check out Fourth and Heart Ghee. Okay, I talk about ghee in my videos all the time, and it's actually gonna come up in this video a little bit in terms of like getting your body saturated with the right kind of fats to be more fat adapted. But ghee is where they take butter and they get rid of everything except for the pure butter fat. So you're left with pure, like literally fat that is very, very good when it comes down to creating more butyric acid within your gut and actually just stimulating a lot of positive things. Plus, it is delicious. And Fourth and Heart has a Himalayan salt ghee, Himalayan pink salt ghee, which tastes delicious. So you can check them out on Amazon or if you want to learn more about them, I also put a link down to their main website as well. The company is called Fourth and Heart. I've talked about them on Thrive Market before. I've talked about them in various videos. I've talked about them in grocery hauls. Just hands down the best tasting ghee that is out there with a wide variety of flavors. So check them out down below in the description on Amazon and at their site down below after this video. The first thing that you can do to improve the length of your fast and get better at doing longer fasts is just kind of what I mentioned a second ago, implementing fat fasting now and then. Okay, it's a very simple thing. Okay, when you add fats to a fast, technically you're not fasting, but you're adding more of the fats that are going to marinate the cells in that fat. That sounds crazy, right? Like marinating cells and fat. You're not literally marinating them, but what's happening is when you expose your cells to more fats during a fasted period, the cells have no choice but to start adapting and upregulating what's called PPAR alpha. PPAR alpha is what allows us to adapt to using fat as a fuel source. So the longer that we fast, the more PPAR that we activate we can activate more and kind of adapt to this process a little bit faster by every once in a while doing a fat fast. So let's say maybe you can only fast for 18 hours. Well, try doing a 20 or 24 hour fast, but at that 18 hour mark, go ahead and have a tablespoon of ghee or a tablespoon of coconut oil or you know, something like that that's pure fat that doesn't have any carbs, anything else. It's literally just some fat to sort of upregulate and push fats upon the cell so they're forced to develop the machinery to utilize it. That is probably the first thing that I would do that's very, very effective. The next thing is when you start your fast, the last meal that you consume, try increasing your fiber content or try adding what is called fenugreek fiber, okay, fenugreek powder. There are some studies that demonstrate that just eight grams of fenugreek powder, which you get anywhere at Whole Foods or online on Amazon, whatever, is very, very effective at satiating you and also just keeping you satiated for hours on end. You see, fenugreek contains something called galactomannan fiber, which draws a lot of water into the colon. Not only is this good for the gut microbiome, but it's good for satiety. Okay, then another study has demonstrated that 1.2 grams of fenugreek seed extract, if you wanted to take it in capsule form or in a smaller amount, can have a very similar effect on satiety as well. What is this gonna do? Well, it's gonna help you get through your fast a little bit longer. It's gonna make you feel like the first few hours just are almost non-existent you will find that you'll be able to inch your way through a longer fast that much easier if you load up on soluble fiber prior to going into it. Another fiber that you can have is called glucomannan fiber. Maybe you've heard of like shirataki noodles or some of those kinds of things. That's another tremendous fiber, cognac root, same kind of thing. The next tip is a very important one. Increase the length of your fast before you increase the frequency, okay? If you increase the frequency of your fasting, it's going to be detrimental. You're gonna slow down your metabolism and you're not going to get as many benefits of the fast. You still want your metabolism to be relatively fast so that when you are in a fasted state, your body burns fat and upregulates all these like other energy substrate processes so it's using fat on your body for fuel. It's very important. The New England Journal of Medicine had published a study that was really interesting. It showed that just a 10% weight loss that happened relatively rapidly would result in a 136 calorie decrease in the resting metabolic rate in addition to what was already accounted for with the weight loss. So we know when weight is lost, 
your metabolism is going to slow down to adjust to that. If you're a 500 pound person and you lose weight to 200 pounds, your metabolism is not going to remain as if you were 500 pounds because then your metabolism would be lightning fast for your weight. Okay, so that was all accounted for, but they found there was an additional. When 10% of weight was lost, not only did they lose their metabolism associated with the weight, but they lost a bonus 136 calories per day, meaning their metabolism slowed down that much. What am I getting at with this? Well, one more study. The International Journal of Obesity found that just a three months of a 25% caloric reduction resulted in eight to 10% decrease in metabolism. What I'm saying here is that if you fast too frequently, your body and your mind and everything cannot find this line of delineation between what is an acute stressor with fasting and what is just chronic caloric deprivation. So by fasting more frequently, you don't solve the problem. You actually make matters worse and you make it harder for your body to fast. You're just gonna get, you're just gonna reduce your metabolism and slow down your caloric intake. That's, that's all you're gonna do. However, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, on the contrary, published a study that showed that when you go into an acute fast, when your body's not like, fasting every day, but it's the anomaly, well, your metabolism increases for the first three days of a four-day fast. I'm not saying you jump out and do a three-day fast or a four-day fast, but the point is, is that when fasting is the anomaly, you actually increase your metabolism and thereby increase the amount of fats that your cells are pulling in, getting them more fat adapted. So you're better off to say, I'm going to embark on one to two longer fasts per week, and I'm gonna to commit to that, and I'm gonna increase the duration of these fasts until I get better at fasting. That's a much better solution than saying, I'm gonna fast every day to increase my total quote unquote fasting time. Next up is having green tea, coffee, and ginger during your fast. So green tea specifically upregulates CPT. So it upregulates what are called fatty acid transporters. So not only does it improve the lipolysis, the mobilization of fats, but it also improves the transporters that bring the fat into the cells. What is this going to do? Well, everything I've talked about is about getting the cells properly saturated in fat so you're fat adapted. That way when you fast, you're not starving for glucose and feeling hungry. Your body knows how to use the fat so it pulls fat from your body. But if you increase your CPT, your, your transporters, then you're able to actually mobilize and utilize that fat a little bit better. Now, there was a study published in the journal Metabolism that found that if you just use pulverized ginger, added ginger, it would increase the thermic effect. So that would mean if you added that with your breakfast meal or even the meal prior to going into your fast, it would increase the thermic effect of that food, thereby improving how your body extracts nutrients from it, potentially getting you fat adapted a little bit faster. Plus, ginger has some powerful effects when it comes down to autophagy as well, which is just a side benefit when it comes to fasting. Another fun thing to kind of throw in there just as an extra is if you're into yerba mate, this is pretty wild because yerba mate can improve your fatty acid oxidation during a fast. So there's a study published in the journal Nutrients where it took a look at subjects that were in a fasted state and they did a uh, cardio session at 60% of their max heart rate. Well, prior to that cardio session, they had some yerba mate. They only had two grams of it too, so it wasn't like they had all that much. So just that two grams of yerba mate prior to that fasted workout ended up improving their fatty acid oxidation rates tremendously, showing that if you're in a fasted state, yerba mate not just gives you a little bit of an energy boost and a mental clarity thing, but it actually upregulates how much fat your body uses for fuel, which could be very powerful, again, at conditioning the body to use fats, allowing you to fast longer. Seeing the common theme here, right? This one is super important. It's more of a mistake, more of a no-no. Do not fast on your stressful days. It's only going to set you back. Fast on days that you feel good. I know it sounds bad because fasting should be a stressor that you can just use whenever. But if you are getting yourself to a point where you're trying to get better, trying to get better at doing longer fast, working your way up to a 48 or a 72 hour fast, fasting during stressful times is only gonna set you back, okay? It's going to increase your cortisol so much because your cortisol levels are already high when you're fasting. Then they're high when you're stressed out. So you've got these double powerful cortisol whammy explosion happening, okay? And that's going to affect your visceral fat. Why? The visceral fat, which is like the pot belly fat, the fat that's underneath our organs, okay? That is rich in what are called glucocorticoid receptors. So what happens is when we have a stress response like cortisol, it binds the receptors in our visceral fat and it triggers what's called adipogenesis, which means it stores fat in the visceral region. Now, you're not consuming calories during a fast, so you're not exactly going to like store fat, but what you are going to do is at least stop the lipolysis. You're gonna stop the mobilization of that fat. So you're gonna not burn fat. So you're gonna burn fat maybe in other areas, but it's gonna allow you to kind of maintain that sort of like almost skinny fat look or just that pot belly. We don't really want that. 
Visceral fat accumulation may very well be an adaptation to stress. Because visceral fat has such a strong affinity for cortisol, it makes sense from a correlation standpoint that as our body recognizes us getting more and more stressed, it increases visceral fat because it knows the visceral fat will respond to the stress. So then it becomes sort of a protective mechanism. The body says, uh-oh, stressed again, let's add more fat here that's gonna allow him to react to that stress better and allow him to survive with more fat in his belly. See what I'm saying here? So don't fast when you're stressed out, fast when you're feeling good. And there's sort of a couple to that, fast on days that you're not bored either, okay? So don't fast on bored days where you're gonna stress yourself out thinking about nothing but food, okay? That's just a side note. Now this last tip is one of the most important ones and it's very effective, okay? Everything I've talked about has been about getting the cells marinated in fat properly to upregulate PPAR alpha. What about walking? Simply burning the fuel. But a low intensity walk during a longer fast will make a huge difference in your hunger. It will make it so that your body has to use the fats that are being mobilized. There's a difference between lipolysis and oxidation. Okay, lipolysis is where you are mobilizing fat from the storage form. Oxidation is where you're actually burning it. So let's say for a second you're improving lipolysis and mobilizing all this fat, but you're not actually moving and burning it. So it's just gonna recycle and restore. It's just mobilized for a minute and then it goes right back to where it was from. It's like it walks out of its house, goes around the block and goes right back into storage. But what if it were to walk outside of its house, go around the block and then get eaten by a unicorn? That's what we want. Not necessarily the unicorn, but we want it to get gobbled up and burned. So while you're mobilizing all this fat because you're fasting, go for a simple walk. It doesn't even have to be a high heart rate. You just wanna be burning. You will find that if you get hungry at like 18, 19 hours into a fast and you go for a walk, all of a sudden you're forcing fats into the cell because the cell needs fuel and you're gonna get A, more fatty acid oxidation, but B, you're gonna feed yourself, for lack of a better term, and the cells will feel occupied and they'll send that signal to your brain, allowing you to fast longer. I hope these tips help you out. I'll see you tomorrow.